the Summer Brothers Smother Show, starring Glenn Campbell and his writers, John Hartford, Carl Gottlieb, Rob Reiner, Steve Martin, Bob Einstein, <laughs> Mason Williams, um, McLean Stevenson briefly, Lorenzo Music, who had created Rhoda in Newhart, uh, and, and some other, Cecil Tuck, who, who wrote Pat Paulson's material. It was an amazing writing room. So this is now your first TV writing job? My first free TV writing job. Okay, so... Summer Brothers, some other show. So talk about, first of all, what the show was and what were you writing? Well, it was a showcase for, for Glenn Campbell, obviously, so he was going to do musical stuff. Yeah. But because it was musical comedy variety, and that's, uh, that's the, uh, the Emmy category in which we won, uh, the, the, uh, uh, we did a lot of sketches. You know, the, the, I think liber uh, and, and we did very political material. Uh, if if we could, I think uh, Glenn uh, had, I think Joan Baez. I I, no, I I can't remember if we had political guests, but Tommy was constantly pushing the envelope with Vietnam War references and Nixon references and jokes, and some of us on the staff, particularly me, who came out of that social satire background got to write material that was A, in our wheelhouse, B, that the Smothers liked for themselves to do or their mm -hmm. guests, and C, it was socially relevant material which fit Tommy's model and Mason Williams, who was pushing Tommy to be more, uh, to, I won't say pushing him to the left, he was pushing him into, uh, in, into doing, comedy about the world we live in. I don't, I don't know what you would call that. Now, how hands-on was Tommy with the Glenn Campbell show? Tommy and Dick really ran the Glenn Campbell show. They, they were basically rehearsing because they were uh, re cutting their chops as producer because in, in the fall, Ilson and Chambers were let go because they, they, and they don't, didn't have a part in the show. And Tom and Dick inherited their show, so all they had to do was hire line producers. So they basically they were showrunners. Learned how to produce television for the summer replacement show. Well, they did, they had two years, you know, as as stars to, right. to you know, to, and with whatever measure of control stars have, and Nelson and Chambers pretty much gave them their head because their instincts were good, mm -hmm. and then they got the the Campbell show where they got a staff that was of their own choosing, mm -hmm. and then when it came time to do the show in the fall for the network and return to the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, all the elements were in place. Fresh new writers, artistic control, mm -hmm. and uh, a place in the ratings that you know, allowed them a lot of latitude. So who ran the, the writer's room? Uh, Was it Mason Williams? No, Tommy hired um, uh, Alan Bly. Oh, and, okay. Uh, who had been partners with Chris Beard, right, from Laughing, but Alan Bly became our producer. He was like our executive producer, and Tom and Tommy was hands on and would go over all the material. Dick was less involved in the day to day production; he had other interests at the time. Uh, but Tommy took a very active interest in the show. It was a very hands on producer. All right, so let's talk about that group of guys in that room. First of all, you got to know Rob a bit from improvising together sure. on stage. But yeah. this is someone, obviously, that would be, you know, very important going forward in your career. Sure. So talk about writing with Rob. Well, uh, uh, it was great working with Rob because... Uh, because of his growing up in television comedy, consider, consider his pedigree, he was like 22 years old and had an opinion about everything. He was, he was, he was loud and opinionated and generally right, but it was, it was kind of funny to see him at age 22 telling everybody else what was funny. What's Steve Martin like? Um, <laughs> Just as he is today, he was he was reserved off stage. 
and serious about the art and craft of comedy. And, uh, you, you know, he, he enjoyed performing because he would do you know, a banjo duet with, he would play with Glenn and they would do John Hartford songs too. You know, John was, John Hartford was, was uh, there because he had written Glenn's big hit and that was a theme song for the show, was Gentle on My Mind. Mm -hmm. And John Hartford had written that. I guess that's funny thinking about the Glenn Campbell and the Smothers Brothers of it all. It makes so much sense that Mason Williams and Steve Martin, who were not only funny, but gifted musicians, would make sense in this world as well. Exactly. And they, they, they also understood concept comedy. I mean, we did a sketch with uh, Liberace. And Liberace was, you know, obviously the consummate showman. But when he came to do our show, uh, Smothers, he was game for whatever we would, you know, ask him to do. So we did a sketch where he was playing the minute waltz, classically on a Steinway Grand, and Bob Einstein rolled in on a motorcycle dressed as Officer Judy and wrote a ticket. He says, you're doing the minute waltz, you did it in 53 seconds, you're speeding. And Liberace said, oh, I'm so I had to say I'm sorry, and was, and he played it. He mugged and he, 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 he went along with the gag. He was, he was happy to do comedy. So now, um, Bob, Einstein, we should point out, also known as Super Dave Osborne, right. and later Marty Funkhauser on, on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Right. Was Albert Brooks's older brother. Okay, so talk about Bob Einstein around that time, and also if Albert was around, because I know he and Rob were very close. Right, Rob, uh, Albert was around, Albert was working on his single, uh, uh, Albert wanted to be a, a solo artist. He didn't want to be an ensemble artist, so he wasn't in Rob's improvisational company, but he was around doing comedy. And then and Rob, at that right around that point, met and married Penny Marshall, who was a queen of television comedy, who would go on to become a queen of television comedy in her own right. Uh, and it, it, we all hung out a lot. I mean, Rob and Penny had a little house in the valley, in Valley Village. And every the weekend, you know, they would have parties and everybody would show up. And uh, Michael McKeon and David Lander, better known as Lenny and Squiggy from the Laverne and Shirley, got that job because they, they did those characters for Gary Marshall and Penny and all of us at a party. And that was, that was two characters they used to do at the Carnegie Tech when they were students together. Remember, mm. it was a very small world of comedy. Everybody it's knew very everybody incestuous. else. And, and in some cases, we were related. Uh, <laughs> Albert Brooks uh, would, uh, he, he, was, he was the funniest guy in the room. And that was a very tough room, but he was the funniest guy there. And he once uh, was at a party and got on a roll and was just spritzing gold, dynamite, comedy stuff. And when he finished, he, he left. He left the party because he, he, he couldn't top himself. He had a showman's instinct. I'm not going to try to top myself. So he left. Then he had to call from the street an hour later. He said, Rob, I left my wallet at the house. I don't want to go back. <laughs> I, I, I did so well. You know? <laughs> so Rob had to go out and give him his wallet. Hilarious. But you know, all that all that talent was was around. You know, and, and, and Steve to answer your question about Steve Martin, Steve Martin was very serious about comedy. And even then. Even then. Especially then. I mean even his own stuff, even this was before Wild and Crazy Guy. This was but he was doing he was doing absurdist comedy. He was doing Arrow Through the Head and Bunny Ears and the first album, you know, Best Fishes where he had a big fish on the cover. Mm -hmm. He saved all the craziness for on stage, and off stage, he was very quiet and serious, mm. and is to this day. He he was the observant novelist as well as the zany stand-up. 